we'll be hearing an announcement about that. Um, so now I've got the pleasure of introducing Suzanne Bachner. Um, Suzanne was born and raised and adopted in New York City through Louise Wise Services. She's an award-winning playwright and director. Um, Suzanne's acclaimed adoption plays include uh, Birthday, Twin Studies, Alice Through the Looking Glass, We Call Her Benny, and Brilliant Mistake. Her award-winning show, The Good Adoptee, has toured to the London International Fringe Festival across the US and reached a global audience in its virtual presentations, all in support of adoptee rights. Um, we were honored to have Suzanne here in Cleveland in 2016, uh, helping us celebrate the first anniversary of our opening day at a conference that we had. Um, and I saw this morning that uh, the play has been nominated for yet another award um, for a um, solo show of the year award. So congratulations, Suzanne. Um, we're dreaming about bringing the um, play uh, back to Ohio at some time um, in the near future. But if you haven't seen it, don't wait. Um, Suzanne has um, put a generous offer on Vimeo. Um, she's recently posted a recording of the play there. And uh, to um, help us celebrate the Monday evening speaker series for our audience, there's a discount available uh, for a $15 discount using the code ANC, which gives you 72 hour, 72 hour access to watch the play for $4.99. And I think that Suzanne is extending that for a week for anybody who's um, here interested in the next week. I will be putting some links in the chat to uh, the uh, website for The Good Adoptee and for Suzanne's theater. Um, and uh, please do go ahead and put any questions or comments that you have um, for Suzanne in the chat as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Suzanne. Thanks. Thank you so much, Betsy. I am so thrilled and honored and excited to be here tonight. And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all, friends, old and new. Um, I am going to attempt to tell you the story of The Good Adoptee, uh, my little baby play that could and, and is and would. Um, so I'm going to start at the very beginning of, of the making of this play, which is when I met my mentor or one of my wonderful mentors, Adrienne Kennedy, who just had her Broadway debut at 91 years old with Ohio State Murders. Um, and when I started working with her, she asked me to, or invited me, I, I guess, to, to write about the most tumultuous time of my life. Um, and I knew immediately when she said that, what that was, um, which was a time when I was in high school um, and uh, my adoptive parents and me, who we call it ourselves the tripod, um, and uh, we, we had this moment where we all three of us um, had life-threatening illnesses at the same time or sort of in, in a flurry. And, um, and, and that was really it. And I started writing about that. Um, and even though that time um, and that those stories are not actually in the play of The Good Adoptee, um, that was really the, the start of it. And, and uh, Ms. Kennedy, um, basically said, well, you know, you, you really need to write about adoption. Um, and I already knew this, and it was something that I wrote about a lot in, as a playwright, um, on and off. Um, and it's something my, my uh, original mentor, Romulus Linney, also told me um, when I, I wrote my first adoption play, Birthday, in graduate school when I was working with him. And um, he very solemnly said, this is what you need to write about. Um, and, and anyways, when something like that comes up, um, it, there's sort of that, uh, I'm gonna go racing away from this as fast as I possibly can, because it's like a hot potato. Um, and uh, I didn't totally, totally avoid, um, because I, I did start writing this play and it wasn't at all like a play, because it was, you know, I was just writing my experience and Adrian Kennedy said, just it, don't worry about being a play or not, just, just write it. Um, so, so I started doing that. And um, it was also a time when I was working with the love of my life, Bob Brader, 
who is here tonight. And um, he had created a solo show called Spinning in the Face of the Devil, which is one of the most brave groundbreaking pieces of uh, solo theater I have ever witnessed. I also got to direct it, which was a great honor. And um, he kind of raised the stakes for me with telling my adoption story because I had done so many fictional plays, so many dramatized pieces, you know, where there was truth and, and authentic authenticity, but it wasn't my true, totally true story, which is sort of a different level. And with, with Bob um, inspiring with Spinning the Face of the Devil, I knew that if I was going to tell my story at this point, it needed to be the totally true story, uh, which I had never done. Um, and it was also around this time that I started um, kind of coming into adoption consciousness, but also um, I was I was just starting to search. I was just trying to, I was just starting to sort of pull that curtain away and say, oh, I, I am I am allowed to do this. I am permitted to do this. I have to do this. And so I started, uh, I started my search. And when I was doing my search, um, this was at the time that I was, that I was working with Adrian Kennedy. I, I started obsessively recording every single piece of it. I mean, if I had said, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call uh, this number and see if someone answers on the other end of the line and it's just like a superstition and I found this number in the gutter and I'm just gonna like follow my instincts on it. I would do it, I would record it. And it was just like I was um, exercising a certain amount of um, control, the kind of control that we adoptees are, are, are robbed of in, in that sort of um, entering moment in our in our lives, and I was just sort of trying to make up for it. So I was I was trying to control each and every moment of this Nancy Drew crazy search that I was on, um, and I had no idea. I was you know it was sort of like I had this notebook, and part of it was the Adrian Kennedy stuff, and the other part you know, and I was writing about being a child and adoption and all this stuff, and then the other part was this. Um, this search journal that I was obsessively keeping that was boring and I would never, you know, why would I ever use this for anything else? But I had to like check on something because I was such a great detective, <laughs> not at all. Um, so so that's how, how the play started. Um, and uh, I, I put it into uh, the United Solo Theater Festival um, and United Solo has a history of elevating adoptee voices. And there were a lot of adoptee stories um, that were told there over the time. And actually Bob's Spitting was in the first festival alongside Brian Stanton's incredible play Blank. And we never connected at that moment in time till later. Um, so it was, it was this sort of safe space for adoptee stories. It was kind of a space that said, if you haven't written your adoptee story, get on it and give us your play. Um, and so I, I was called to do that. And the problem when you, you know, enter a festival and your, your work is taken is that you actually have to produce that work. Um, and that can be a problem if you're still writing it. <laughs> so I was in that situation where I was um, drafting the play and and workshopping it with the amazing actress Anna Bridgeforth, who who did debut the play eventually. But I was just doing these like little um, private workshops where I would just draft, and then she would read it to me, and we'd play all these crazy improv games around it. And I would you know ask her to be my my crazy um, half brother, and she would terrify me, and I would realize oh I really shouldn't go. Um, be in his presence in real life, probably because he had just channeled something really scary. Um, so, so I was doing that process, and Bob, I had asked to be my dramaturg for the show, um, and uh, he was getting a little worried because we had to present the play in United Solo, and I was working on another play, of course, because why should I, you know, focus on the depths of adoption? That's like terrifying. So he, he kind of took me aside and, and said, Suzanne, 
you have to deliver this play. So maybe you should focus on, on writing this play. Um, and so uh, he would kind of uh, get me together with my computer like I was a little school child because I can't work in at home. I have to go out and be around other people. Um, which I think is sort of an, an adoptee thing, especially working on an adoptee play, because it's it's that that scare of isolation that unless you are connected to other people, you will sort of not belong and disappear into a a spool of abandonment and rejection. So I couldn't I work at home. I had to go out. So Bob would get me together and like you know tie my snowshoes and everything and kind of like throw me out of the house, at least into the hallway. And I think he finally realized he also had to put me into the elevator or it would not going to happen at all. So I would go to this, this crazy coffee shop, which was, which was like one of the fake Starbucks. It doesn't have the whole line of Starbucks. And it was in this hotel that was diagonally across from our house. And it was this huge white room. And I called it the asylum. And I, no one knew about this space. So there was no, never anyone there only like people staying in the hotel going places. And so I would sit there and like write the, the good adoptee. Um, and um, at a certain point, Bob said to me, I think that you have met with Anna for many hours having her read your play and you keep generating more material. So what is going on? You know, like, can, can I see some of it? I mean, I'm, I know it's wonderful, but like, I'm just getting concerned that it's going to be too long for, for the, for our 90 minute slot. Um, and so I was like, no, that's fine. It's fine. And so he said, why don't you sit down and read it to me? Why don't you read me the play? Um, that just everything you have, and it'll help you kind of get it off the page. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And so I read the play to Bob. And it took seven hours. I'm not kidding. I mean, first of all, Bob has the patience of a saint, and I think he is a saint. But it was seven hours. We took a dinner break and came back, and uh, I, I was amazed. I didn't know I had that much. And uh, so he finally gave me his dramaturgical input, which is what he said. I have three plays, all great, but you have to pick one. So one is about adoptee childhood. One is about... Um, the search. And then the third play is about reunion. And like, they're all great plays, but you have to pick one. You can't tell all of those stories in 90 minutes. So, um, you know, he said this and I immediately knew that I needed to tell the story about the search um, because that was what had the dramatic motor more than the other pieces. It just had this built in dramatic piece. So I was telling a story on stage. It had to have that dramatic motor to keep it going and to keep um, the audience focused on it. And I also really wanted to tell people, um, non-adopted people, um, what I had discovered as, um, as an adult, which is, you know, that we mostly in this country did not have um, ownership of our original birth certificates. Um, because whenever I mentioned that to just a random person, um, you know, during my search and all of this stuff, they were pretty slap jawed about it. Um, and I felt like I want to tell this in a play to convey what the psychological toll of that is, that inequality um, and, and that, that lack of knowing your own, uh, your own piece, your own origins in that way that, uh, that a non-adopted person would not even think twice about, um, would just take for granted. So, so, um, so I, I, I went forward, I said, oh, and once I found out that this play was about the search, everything fell into place. I worked my tail off trying to get it in on time for this show because I also had to direct Anna. Poor Anna is like waiting for her pages to do. And, and I'm sitting there, you know, like, oh, I'm going to write and write and write. So, um, so luckily I also had Bob um, as this like expert dramaturg also telling me when I was getting on the soapbox you know, when, because I just did right now with you guys and no one no one in this room probably needs to hear all that. You're on, on the soapbox with me. 
but um, you know, you you if you're going to present this to an audience and you want them to understand this this um, you know the horrible situation, then you have to let them see it for themselves. And so whenever I was getting on the soapbox in the play, uh, Bob would would just you know gently tell me, and and I would get off. I hope I hope there are no soapbox moments in it. Um, but anyway, so then we we're able um with Anna's sheer brilliance uh in in absorbing this as a non-adopted person and just nailing like every universal theme in it um to convey the adoptee experience or at least I will say my adoptee experience because that was what her job was um we we got the we got the play up and when we first got the play up um it was a general audience it was like mostly um, a, a general audience, and I felt like we were um, conveying these universal themes of identity, belonging, human connection, and family, which everyone could relate to, and then sort of through that shared experience, see more specifically, again, my adoptee experience, um, and, and, and what connected us. Uh, but towards the end of our run, because we kept, we were very lucky and we kept getting extended, extended and extra shows. And towards the end of the run, um, something interesting started happening, which is what members of the adoptee community heard about the show and started coming. And it was incredibly validating, um, but they were still within this general population of, you know, of theater goers, um, you know, on, on Theater Row. So it was, it was not like, the adoptee community it was members of, you know, and I was very nervous about how the play was going to come off to a first uh, birth mom. I, I was very nervous. And I think, you know, in retrospect, it was partly like I was, you know, again, the good adoptee and I wanted parental approval. Even if the parents weren't my own parents, I wanted parental approval for this. And I was, you know, a few birth moms saw it and were very positive about it and I felt better about it. And then of course I was terrified about my own parents and how they would react because this is the first time I was writing an adoption story that was not fictionalized in some way. Um, you know, and I, and I had a lot of sort of magical realism type adoption stories. And suddenly I had a character, mom and dad, um, and Anna, who knew my parents, said, please don't have them sit in the front row, whatever, whatever happens, just ask them to do that. I can't, I can't like look them in the eyes when I'm, you know, doing them, you know, performing the, the parts of mom and dad. Um, and the funny thing was that when I wrote the play, it ended up that um, mom and dad and, you know, birth mom were not the main characters of the play. Um, and I think this is something that Anna and and Bob dramaturgically really encouraged me in. But as I wrote the play, I realized like, oh, I'm the main character. This is about me. This isn't about other people. There, you know, the the parents were were you know supporting characters, um, and actually like the social worker um, and the searcher um, actually are larger parts because they were more integral in, in that journey that I had in, in searching. And, um, and uh, it's funny because people are like, you know, they get nervous, like, oh, you're gonna, I'm in your play. And, and they, they get nervous, like, oh, how am I gonna be portrayed, all of this stuff. And then they're kind of disappointed that they don't have bigger parts. So it's this weird, <laughs> this weird dynamic. Um, but right before we are about to, um, debut the play, I really just sort of panicked. And, and um, I, I talked to my mom and I said, I'm really terrified you're going to disown me and hate me forever and, you know, not love me anymore. And, and, and she just sort of stopped me and said that that was, you know, ridiculous. And, you know, I should talk me down. Um, and Bob said, you know, I told you so, <laughs> you know, but it, it, and it makes no sense. I mean, saying this now, it seems so absurd that I would ever think that, but I really, really did, you know, I really did think that. And um, uh, I remember when they first came to see it, 
they were they were actually pretty much in shock and kind of couldn't talk about it. And then they came back to another show and they were um, they were able to see the show and and not um, not engage in, in it um, with all of the expectations and all of the baggage. Um, you know, and my father to this day, uh, says that he has the best line in the play because he has a, you know, a, a son of Sam line, um, in the, in the play that, that gets laughs usually. And, um, and so he has this sort of pride level that he, that he has the funniest line in the play. Um, but, but seriously, this, this play um, opened up a, a door with my parents and I that um, I didn't even realize was closed because um, there was so much that s- sort of the, the expectations again of the adoption industry in having them acquire me and the way that the whole thing was packaged back when I was an infant where there was blank slateism, where there were there there was this sort of thing of like, oh, now you are their child and everything else is gone and there's only one set of parents. Um and and that hurt all three of us, the tripod. It was something that was incredibly damaging and we didn't realize, you know, I I had the whole um you know the the super wanted baby stories and all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, we all thought that that was, that that was good. And that was something that was supportive. And that's something that was going to, um, you know, make all of the possible insecurities that, uh, you know, as someone who was relinquished and switched families, that 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 was all going to go away because of that. So sometimes, having my parents see something I've written and a story I've told on stage, um, it's, I'm able to communicate with them more fully than if I'm in the room with them, you know, and we're interrupting each other and talk. There's something that comes through and they actually saw the play the second time with um, my mom's first cousins who are also adoptive parents. And so there were four adoptive parents um, sitting there together, seeing it. Um, and my dad walked me because we went out for this. Um, my in-laws were there, Bob's mom and uh, and sister and husband. Everyone was there for this, and so we were able to go out uh, to to dinner afterwards. And um, my dad sort of walked me down the street, and he said, "I knew that you could tell a story so strongly and on stage, but I didn't know you could do this." Um, and it was it it was so touching, um, and and since then they've been just like huge super fan supporters of the play, um, and um, and of adoptee rights efforts as well. You know, in in tandem with the play, um, and that dinner was like such a wonderful experience of this, you know, this this family of all different sorts. And there wasn't birth or, or for, you know, first family involved in that, but it was, it was like a, it was like a little microcosm of that feeling of Bob's family, my in-laws and of my mom's first cousins and, uh, you know, adopted families, because you could see at that table that actually there was so much connection um, and, and nothing by blood, but, but deep, deep connection. Um, so, so that happened (laughs) and, and then, um, I had this incredible, incredible opportunity, um, to tell the story fully, uh, to the adoption community or to part of the adoption community in the form of adoption network Cleveland. So as Betsy said, um, in her intro, we were, um, at this conference um, and it was celebrating the um, one year anniversary of opening day. Um, And it was a huge honor to be part of this conference. And I had never been to an adoption conference before. um, And it was overwhelmingly incredible. 
um, and to present the play there was a huge honor. And there was so much joy. And Bob came, you know, we were doing the play with Anna. And, and that's really when we realized that uh, part of Bob and Anna's roles were as allies. And I started realizing how important it was that there were a group of NAPs, non-adopted non people who were, who were integral in, in putting this play on because it was this, this window, this, this uh, connection to the general population and um, the ability to understand this, this kind of experience of adoption um, and not the rainbow and unicorns kind through, through um, non-adopted people who had skin on, in the game from you know, their own choices, like Bob's dumb choice of being with an adoptee and love and life. <laughs> and, uh, and of course I'm kidding, but um, you know, and Anna's in, in fully delving into this experience um, on stage. She had never done a solo show before and she just leapt into it and, and is exquisite. Um, so, so, so we came to this conference and I have to say that, uh, there was a duck decoy convention going on at the same time. So there were all of these duck people who were wandering around. And so it was like, either you were a duck decoy person or you were an adoptee person. And it really was like, it was this little universe for that weekend in this hotel where those were the only people in the entire universe, duck adoptee or adoption, you know, cause it was all members of the community. And it was, and it was so fun and exciting and uh, such a great connection. And Bob was welcomed um, into the partner and spouse adoptee space, which was really uh, a game changer for him and for us to, to have that be defined as a space to be part of. Uh, and having that an ally space as well. Um, and uh, we had the earliest curtain that I think we've ever had in the history of JMTC theater, um, which was at 11 a.m. And I told Betsy at the time, you're not putting us on at 11 a.m. And I don't think uh, Betsy that you still understand how how painful it is to go on 11 a.m. as a <laughs> the theater person, <laughs> um, but it was really wonderful because we got to play to people fresh in the morning of a conference and people, I know a lot of people in this room um, are conference goers and you know exactly what I mean by that. Um, and we were astounded because the, the laughs came at places where, you know, when we, when we were performing for the general population, they were not present. I mean, Anna had to kind of like uh, adjust in the on the fly because all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, people are laughing at this. I mean, this is something that we thought was hilarious and devastating and, you know, we'll never get over, but how, how are we in a room full of people who understand that? Um, so she had to modulate um, having this, this reaction, like it was this seismic shift being able to play to the the um, adoption community, it was just a completely different experience. And you know, there were also just these moments, where, you know, where you could feel a, a you know hear a pin drop, and it was the same kind of thing because they were in different places. Um, and you know, we really understood with those experiences how, like, how a general population so gravely misunderstands adoption. Um, so, and, and, and how, how sacred it is and what a, you know, gift it is, what a, you know, what a, just a incredible thing it is to, to perform for an adoption community audience. Um, and the, the, one of the things that just is, um, powerful is that when you tell your story on stage like this, people come up to you and share theirs with you. And it is such an honor. And there's just this sense of, uh, 
uh, fabric being sewn and um, a connection which is which is just different than than in any other community that I've experienced. Um, because I could go, I would not have to go to the asylum to write after that, because I, I had I, 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 I am always held by this community, whether parts of the community are next to me or in the other room or a text away or, you know, around the globe. Um, once, once that finding happens, and this is, you know, not about finding um, your, your family, your first family, your original family, um, but finding your family of, of the adoption community, uh, I think it's, it's, it's this phenomenal just shift in, in everything. So there was nothing, there was no place that we went after we had that experience at Adoption Network Cleveland at that conference which was so sacred in, in um, celebrating the opening day. Um, you know, when we took it to um, the tour in Connecticut um, for Access Connecticut uh, to advocate for um, uh, access to original birth certificates for adult adoptees, we were in just this completely different place because we, we had that family uh, behind us. Um, and there's, there's no other validation that I can even explain or comprehend that once your experience is validated by your adoption community family, uh, no one can shake it. <laughs> it's like, oh, I said I wouldn't cry during this. No one can shake it. You can't. You can't, um, you can't, be, you can't waver. You can maybe doubt for a minute, but you can't be set off course um, in the same way because because you have that grounding and an understanding of um, of your your truth. Um, and I don't think uh, I don't think I would have had that experience in that same way had I not. Um, had the insane idea to write a play that was that truthful about my adoption experience. Um, and, it, and it was funny because in this weird way, I had these allies, you know, particularly in Bob and Anna, um, who got me to that moment um, or helped me get there. Um, so I had these these allies who are non-adoptees um, who really like delivered me and ushered me to this, to have this connection, which I think was scary um, to have. It's like when I, when I was talking about Adrian Kennedy having, you know, encouraging me to start this play and write about adoption. And it's like the flame and you're drawn to the flame and you, you know, you don't want to get hurt by the flame and you want to run away from the flame. And it's the same kind of thing. Um, so I think that I found the adoption community um, as a connection at the time when I was able to uh, be open and step into it and and um, and welcome it into my life. And I have not been the same ever since. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I forgot to tell people in your introduction, Suzanne went to Oberlin for anybody who's here from Ohio. Um, so one of our Ohio claims to fame. Um, and uh, it was wonderful to hear your experience at the conference. I don't think we had, um, I haven't heard all of that. And so um, really great to hear that perspective even seven years later. So thanks. Um, we had some really good questions from the audience, and if anybody has others, please post them. Um, so early on, somebody asked, how, how true is totally true, and how do you choose? Totally true is, um, I mean, there there is human human memory and, and this, this kind of thing that goes into it. So totally true to me is, 
um, this is exactly how I remember it. The only thing that I've altered from that totally true in, in the piece um, is that the social worker's name was not um, Penny Link. Um, I, ca I, I called her Penny Link in the play. I call her Penny Link in the play. Um, and her last name really was Link. And I felt like that's so ridiculous. You're doing this like search for your origins and your social worker who won't tell you, you know, Jack Squat is named Link. You know, it's just <laughs> too much. That's one of those things that like, I felt like this has to be in it. Um, and she was, she was just retiring when I was writing the play, but out of like politeness, out of good adoptee to her, I changed her first name. But as the three amazing actors who I've been very lucky to have in this in this role in this solo show, um, they will all tell you that. Well, they won't probably tell you. But I, I'll tell you that um, in rehearsal, no matter how much I say I'm not going to do it, I when I'm re when I'm directing them, I call them the real name of the social worker. <laughs> it just slips out. <laughs> But that, but that's basic. That's basically the only thing that's not, you know, that I that I consider not true, you know, just that I changed that one name. So as I take part of this question, part of it is what you answered, but then, the, how do you choose parts? So there, you know, there's um, omission. You could choose to leave things out, and maybe because they're uncomfortable, or maybe because they just don't fit, because you had seven hours of material. Um, right. But is there anything, did you find yourself trying to maybe leave certain parts out, I guess? Well, I think, I think I was going at it, you know, as a, as a dramatist. So, so I had to, like one of, you know, I, I, I made my, I set it out that I'm going to tell the truth, but I also had to do my job as a dramatist. So there's so many really hugely tedious and boring things that happen when you're doing a search. Um, and so like, I didn't put all of them in the play because uh, you know, there, there's, there's, there's gaps in the play. And there, there's also a lot of gaps where, where I was sort of doing that dance of, you know, during my search where I was like, you know, full guns, guns blazing search. And then it's like, uh, why did I ever start this search? I don't have to do it today. I'm going to do something else. So, you know, that's the active and non-active searching that I think a lot of people go through. Um, so there, there's moments in the play where, where the narrator, Suzanne, says, time goes by. Um, so, you know, we had to show that Suzanne character, me, had um, those moments of, 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 of non-active searching, but you, you know, I wasn't going to dramatize the Suzanne character like procrastinating because you would fall asleep in the theater <laughs> watching that. So I think, so that's how things get selected. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did have um, Bob Dramaturg sort of, you know, on my, on my tail sometimes to make sure I wasn't, and this is something I did for him as a drama, as, you know, as a solo show writer as well. Um, like, you're not leaving that out because it's embarrassing or shameful or difficult or, you know, whatever. So, mm -hmm. so that's I almost that. like writing a memoir, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, so somebody's asking, um, while you were writing the play, uh, did you ever feel overwhelmed to the point that writing was so hard and triggering that you avoided working on it? Hmm. I think, I think probably yes, but I've blocked it out. And I think, I think the whole concept of triggering was not like when I was actually writing the play that wasn't sort of in my consciousness. So it's hard to say like, oh, was I triggered because I didn't have that framework to, to put on it. Um, I mean, I know that when I was actually searching, I, I would get triggered, which I, which I dramatize in the play. Um, you know, when I'm looking in the library and I can't find my name and I think, oh, I don't exist. 
and I sort of have an existential crisis and then I avoid going. But I think that the writing was very healing and powerful because being able to tell the story in, in a way, you know, like if you're playing the good adoptee, you know, throughout the childhood, which I think I, I was um, for so much of my childhood and you're, you know, you're smiling and happy and playing happy and you don't have any deep, dark thoughts of existential dread. And, you know, it's, it's kind of exhausting. So when you're actually, you know, writing through that and doing the opposite, it's exhilarating and, and ultimately healing and, and powerful and strengthening. So, so I try to keep in, you know, it was sort of like once I started writing, then it was fine. It was sort of before, which is why Bob had to um, treat me like a little kid getting their snowshoes put on and all that kind of stuff and throw me out of the house. Because when I wasn't writing, that's when I was kind of second guessing and, you know, and having, and having a problem, Wh which I think is related. I think that phenomena is all related to being triggered and avoiding. It's, it's, it's like a, the cousin to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, one person is asking, and maybe she wasn't here when we were talking about the Vimeo, you could explain the Vimeo more, but we had a question um, if there would be a recording for sale that she feels it might be good for her children to see it. How old? I don't know. <laughs> so put it in chat if you want, whoever yeah, asked you the can, question. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can rent it with the special ANC code. A and C <laughs> and then, and, and that's the, the discount. And so the rental is for 72 hours. I know the kids are very precocious nowadays, so it's hard to <laughs> judge what your child, what is appropriate for your child and not appropriate for another person's child. But in general, we sort of say 16 and up, but um, that's not, you know, and there's some salty language in it. So you, might want actually, to, you get it for 72 hours, so you can watch it first and then decide if you're showing it yeah. to your kids. Yeah. Um, I'm putting the Vimeo link in the chat again for anybody that might have signed on a couple minutes late. So you have that. Um, so when you started out on your search, and you kind of answered this, but um, there was a person that asked ahead of the talk, when you started out on your search, did you have the idea of writing your show? And I guess I would expand on that since you did address that a little bit. Do you feel like it changed your show or it changed your search because it, you kind of did? Um, I mean, I, I so I started writing the play, but I didn't know that it was going to be a search play. So I was writing all of this childhood stuff m more, you know, from my start with with Adrian Kennedy. Um, and then, and that's another Ohio connection, P.S. <laughs> um, but um, when I when I was doing all of the notes, it was it was like I I probably because I'm a writer, I probably said, you know, oh, if I ever need this for the play, I will have it. So you know, and that's I think be like having that writer self. Go, you kind of can go back and forth. And when things get really tricky, you can say, it's for the writer, it's for the play. It's, you know, so it's a little less scary um, because going through that search, you know, some of the things I was uncovering, you know, I was a Louise Wise adoptee. So I was uncovering that, uh, you know, I thought that I could be one of the, one of the, um, identical strangers, twins, you know, in, in the twin study. And so I was uncovering a lot of upsetting things really. Um, you know, I found the, this is not in the play, but I found like the lawyer who my, my parents were working with when they adopted me. And it was, just, there was just a lot of stuff that was difficult. And when you kind of take the step back and they're like, oh, I'm just a stenographer. This is not my life. <laughs> oh, I'm going to use this for the play. It actually psychologically helps because you kind of can step back and remove. But when I did decide to write about the search in the play, I had the best freaking notes. I was like, 
yes, <laughs> I have the best notes. And that's, you know, and that's also when I could more as a dramatist go through and say, this piece of the, this piece of the puzzle is super boring. Like I can't put this in, you know, and then there was, there were things that were actually exciting and interesting um, that, that like we had to lose because of time, because I had to tell a story in 90 minutes. I had to tell a story before you were just like, you know, twitching in your seat and like, can I leave and go pee and et cetera. <laughs> so it could not be an epic. No seven hour play. No. <laughs> um, so we have one member of the audience who says she still vividly remembers experience the good, experiencing the good adaptee on that Sunday morning here in Cleveland. Um, and that she never before had or since has felt so much emotion during a theatrical performance, both laughter and tears through al almost every moment. Um, and her question is, how, uh, you, how do you experience and process your story? How has your experience and process your story changed as the play has been performed in the adoption community now over the last seven years? Can you, can you say the last part again? How has um, what? How has your experience and process of your story changed as the play has been performed in the adoption community since then over the last seven years? Um, so yeah. Cleveland, Cleveland was your first experience in the yeah. adoption community and then you've had more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's, I mean, it is, it is so different having like the complete adoption community, like doing it at a conference versus doing it at a theater where a lot of people come. But sometimes the adoption community can kind of take over. And, and that's what happened to us when we brought this play to Seattle. And this was our last show of The Good Adaptee or any of our plays before the, um, before the pandemic. It was uh, February, 2020. And, and we brought the show to this big theater, the JCC in, in Seattle and and so there was sort of like the Jewish community, sort of like the intention was bringing it to, you know, to this, to the Jewish community in this, in this community in, at the JCC. And the Pacific Northwest adoption community was like, there for a, a basically adoption mosaic, we the experts, the, their last in-person one. Um, and so like, there was like a, a throng of amazing Pacific Northwest adoptees who came to the show and took over the, the 400 seat theater. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes a, a, an audience will unify, but, but this was like the JCC audience and the, uh, this adoption audience that came in and the adoption audience one is all I can say <laughs> because because Haley Palmer uh, who is amazing and she was our our actor at that time she um she she did the show and this was her first time with a heavy adoption and she had the same kind of experience that Anna did when she came to Adoption Network Cleveland um she was like oh my god like laughter totally different places like you know rest it totally different so she she had she had the same kind of experience um but the adoption community won out just dominated the space and then like hung out after the talk back for you know like two hours like we just we just took over the the uh the space and i didn't really know people in that community i just didn't know it was our west coast premiere and it was just like this overwhelming thing um i it probably helped in terms of having that um, that crossover um, because Bob and I stepped off the plane to, to come do the show and went straight to the We The Experts and sort of met everyone. And then it was like, everyone was there the next day for the show. Plus, so, so I mean, I think there's a consistent um, thing. I think the big, like the big difference is I'm kind of like not surprised now. I'm just like, oh, we, you know, we really, it, I feel like the adoption community could really truly rule the world, but we're just too <laughs> polite to do it. Okay, um, so a uh, question um, about was writing the play and presenting it 
a form of therapy for you um, that this person thinks it would be very validating and healing after being so vulnerably exposed to the audience? Well, once you hit the audience, you're not in such a vulnerable place for me. Um, I mean, I may have, it may have sounded like I was saying something different when I was talking about first doing it, but, but yes, it's like, it's so healing. And I actually get a lot of my sort of healing and therapeutic aspects done when I'm rehearsing the play. I don't know if I just like, you know, run through actors. So I have to like start from scratch and, and, and tell and teach another actor how to do the play because it's therapeutic. Um, but, um, but like every time I'm in a different place in my, you know, adoption consciousness and my journey, et cetera. So, so it's like, I have a different layer of healing to do. Um, so like, I mostly, I mean, that's not true. I will cry during, like during a show, like not like sobbing and everyone's turning around to look at me at the back of the house, but, <laughs> but like thing, things, things sort of strike me. And I still have some unresolved stuff that I haven't been able to figure out that are in the play. So it's sort of like whenever I'm rehearsing it or we're doing it in front of an audience, it sort of like slaps me in the face. It's, and it's like, so you still haven't done that. So that still bothers you, you know, like you still haven't figured out things with the paternal side of your, you know, first family, you know? And so it's, it's interesting, but the, the writing, um, was incredibly healing but there is something because because i'm the director working with an actor um where some of it is of course the the art and craft of it and all that kind of stuff but um but the other parts of it um you know can can be very illuminating and healing and it it also seems like there's all of this major adoptee rights um, action going down like when we're rehearsing the play um, and like particularly when Haley was doing the play it was like New York you know went through and and it was unbelievable it was just sort of like oh we had like you know like the house vote and we had a rehearsal and it was I and Haley became kind of like the lucky charm for us we were just like Haley we have another vote can you come rehearse so um that's great so uh i think one last question maybe here um have you shown the good adoptee in miami or are there plans to show it in that area this year um and you by the way you're getting lots of love and comments so we should copy oh, them for you before we're done thank you so um, any plans for miami so we just got on stage for the first time with our new actor um kat nardizi who is incredible and um, she did the play for the first time at the Cub Retreat in, in Tampa. So we were actually in Tampa in October and first time Kat ever did the show, first time you know we, we were back on stage live in person um, since the pandemic. And, um, and then we did it in New York. We would love, love to bring it to um, Miami. Like that would be amazing. And of course, Florida can use some nudging in terms of adoptee rights, as we know. Um, so that would be amazing. So if you have any inroads to help bring us to Miami, please talk to me because we would love that. Okay, you're, you're getting offers for help in the comments. Um, <laughs> oh, somebody else wants to know we're in Ohio, so who knows, but maybe Cleveland, we're in discussion. Um, so I know I said last question, but there's another one. Um, do you have to be careful what conferences um, you take the play to? For example, conferences that might prioritize adoptive families as opposed to adoptees. Do you select your conferences based on the audience? Um, I actually uh, plan to talk about this in my talk, but obviously you all know that I can make a short story super long. So I did not get around to this. <laughs> But um, we went we went through um, a time period where we were really focusing on reaching adoptive parents, um, and that was something that I think I felt you know a few things came up with some um, mishaps with with adoptive parents, like when we were doing our, our Connecticut tour and 
you know, I had this, this adoptive dad um, say to me and they talk back, um, how could you do this to your parents? And, um, you know, and I just wanted to like melt away and everything, but obviously that was just, you know, one of those things. But I, but I felt like, even though that was like, you know, maybe the end of the bell curve of like total ignorance, there was still, there was still something that I felt like we've when we have these times when we've connected with adoptive parents it's been so rich and um powerful and um I, and again it's with that only audience because um we did do um two shows for um long island adoptive families and shaman was like a big um you know fan of the show and wanted to to bring it to that community so so we had these two shows which were all adoptive parents and you know they were also already in community together but there was something special about having a certain conversation and certain level and layer of conversation with specifically adoptive parents um that was quite fruitful i believe and um you know and 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 it was like a it was like an adoptive parent conversation back that was that was that was just a deeper level um and and it was actually right you know right during the the the, the new york fight and so it just felt like there was a lot of allyship in terms of, of that conversation of supporting you know of adoptive parents you know very consciously supporting um their kids uh civil rights and so that was that was really important um, but you know, a lot of a lot of more adoptive family conferences I have approached, and they they, it's just like a lot of times does does not w quite work out. So I don't think it's like it, there's a disconnection of like why would this be good to have at your, you know, and or and or a lot of conferences don't have like don't have theater as part of their programming, you know, so they don't sort of see, like they didn't understand, like Betsy obviously did, you put it in at 11 o'clock, it's not entertainment. <laughs> By the time it gets to eight o'clock, people wanna hang out and you know go to the bar. They don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna go see more stuff that's gonna be a lot. So even though I poo pooed your 11 a.m. at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we all took the risk, it was worth it, so thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Suzanne. This was fantastic. Um, surpassed expectations as always. I really appreciate um, your time and the love that you bring to the community. So thank you. Um, I do have, we ask for people who come to the presentation to fill out a very quick survey at the end. And so if I can do this correctly, I'm going to put this here. Um, so if you um, can, please um, fill out that quick survey. And I just realized I sent something else to one person when I meant to send it to everyone. Um, so here's our calendar to continue the discussion on a more personal level. We have lots of different types of um, discussion meetings and support meetings through the month. So you can check that out on the calendar. Adoption Network Cleveland is a membership organization and we Hope that you will consider joining us and you can check that out on our website as well. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, everyone. Good night.